Folks, it's Friday. First order of business is to uh, give a shout out to my cousin, Daniel Klein. Uh, he is my dad's uh, next younger brother's son, younger son. So like me, he's a younger baby. And, uh, but he is, uh, uh, we have a lot of things in common uh, in terms of how our brains work and things. And, but he's not a watch dude. He um, hand builds custom electronic equipment. Like, uh, well, I should, I should just talk about the thing. Port City. Port City amplifiers. He hand builds the damn things. Yep, Port City. And he's got this, I don't know, it's just, he does nice work. And this isn't even like, it's solid state. It's freaking tube amp. And he does all this work by hand. He sits down and he builds these things. Really, really super, super nice work. Comes with a cloth rack cable and everything. American made speakers. This stuff is the, is the shiznit. He does good work as a Klein. I endorse him. I will just do a quick, I'll talk about, because he made me a custom amp uh, in, a, in a color to match another radio that I got from my dad. And, you know, he does really, really nice work. He literally builds and wires them, everything, all the schematics, everything he does it by hand. Um, and he's, he's a great guy and they've got a, his wife is super nice and they've got a great kid. And, you know, I just wanna, it's not a paid advertisement. You know, he's my family. So there we go. If you happen to be in the North Carolina area, uh, around where um, Port City Amps is, then, you know, go and say hi. Go say hi to my cousin. He's a, he's a heck of a dude. We, we, we chat. Okay. Let's, uh, well, it's Friday. It's Friday. It's Friday and fall's coming in fast. Everything's starting to, everything's starting to drop. And uh, I just, I kind of can't believe it. I'm so pleased that on a complete whim, I started insulating the garage and finishing the garage long enough ago that when the snows hit, it should be, pre it should be pretty nice in there. I, it really should. I'm so, I'm pretty jacked about that. Uh, let's do, uh, let's do wrist check. All right, wrist check. You know what? I realized these things came out so long ago, uh, most people don't remember them at all. I could be wrong. The actual classic first gen um, Stargate SRP, wait, no, wait. Gosh, I'll have to look it up. I can't believe it, I've forgotten the model number. First gen Stargate. I have an um, Z22. Not the the curve vent that it came on. I can't believe I can't remember the first Stargate numbers. Anyway, it's super cool. This one, I've owned a lot of these. This is the last one I bought. Like much of the the other of these first gens, it was made in, God, November 2011, something, I think. Ye, uh, oh, no, no, November, two, wait. 2010 this is it's one of the really early ones when these first came out people were super excited about them like all the old guys were really jacked up about them they thought they were awesome and people started tracking you know dates production dates trying to figure out when they were made and then all of a sudden everyone just stopped caring it's it's odd to me i've often thought it's a very cool watch the how they did this dial is just exquisite they did a great job these watches also look really good with uh, Marine Master handsets. Uh, that's, in my opinion, what they should have had. Anyway. Oh, uh, and this watch has now been fighting for time against this watch, which has been my go-to wearer for ever since I finished restoring it for myself. 6139, 6009, notch, resist, U.S. only watch, it got serviced in the early 1970s, and the two-part sweep was replaced with the one part. But besides that, it's original. That's a nice, nice watch. Okay. Okay. 
uh, Mike Majorana. I hope I got that right. Um, Spencer, you are a lucky man to have someone who loves you enough to bring you fresh brownies. Great video, thanks. Yeah, I am. I'm lucky every single day. Um, it's just, you know, she's she's great. She and I get along really well, and she's always stood by me, and uh, I, I just, I always have to remember to never, ever take her for granted. I try to say think that I don't, but, you know, it's always good to remind yourself that you're in a good situation. Oh, right. Okay, George from Cambridge, England. Hello, Spencer, a question. Do you have any experience with the Sacro, Seiko Astron watches? Um, I know of the originals uh, that were made in the 60s. They were solid gold. It was basically, they were like the first real quartz watch. And they were, they were, it was a big deal. Like the analog quartz watch, they didn't exist prior to that. And um, it was a big, big deal. Uh, and they're extremely expensive. Not, you know, aside from the fact that the cases are literally solid gold. Something that Seiko almost never did. Um... I'm thinking of buying a new JDM Astron, which is SBXY005. Uh, hmm. Mostly because I really like the look of it, but the functionality is great. Solar world time, radio, wave time, reception, etc., etc. It would be a good watch just to grab and go with no worries about setting. It would always be ready. That's true. Somebody, a while back, somebody talked, they asked me that question, you know, what, you know, if you had to have one watch, like a castaway watch. It would have to be like a radio wave one. Uh, it would have to be. Uh, so that if you were on a desert island, it would be solar, it would charge itself, but it would still be talking to satellites. I think I need to reshape this thing, or I have like a cowlick or something? Anyway, but yeah, that's exactly what you want. Um, I don't know, let's, uh, I guess, let's, let's, let's look at that thing real quick. Uh, oh, but he says, I'm a big fan of your, thank you. Thank you for being a fan of the channel. I appreciate it. All I can say is keep up the good work. Oh, and maybe substitute the humming for whistling, sometimes for variety. Cheers from George, Cambridge, England. Uh, the thing about whistling, um, I'm all about whistling. I think it'd be really loud, though. Um, I'm a pretty decent whistler, but also I really jacked up this ear doing construction on the garage. I was taking all these old, these huge old wood screws out and... You know, you're back in this stuff at the end. It's been sitting in place, screwed for 40, 50 years. And you and it's screwed into pretty nicely dry, seasoned wood. Um, and one of the screws was like, when I was backing it out, it was like, Meow! but it was like, I couldn't, it was so loud, I couldn't hear it. I could, I could feel it. It was so loud. It was amazing. And ever since then, I make any loud noises, it's like there's this electronic blue colored fuzz that I hear over everything. So, no more whistling, but thank you for listening. Uh, let's see. John Boy of Alaska. Here are one of the here is one of the anecdotes I wrote down about the ETA automatic works trick. Just stuff so that's helpful. Um as for good watch books, I just got Henry B. Freed's Watch Repairs Manual for Amazon for $18. Great book, well, actually great textbook for any watchmaker, especially those wanting to learn more. That's great. Thank you. That's that's good to know. Henry B. Freed, F-R-I-E-D. So it's not fried. I've got that covered. Um, Henry B. Freed Watch Repairs Manual, Amazon, $18. Yeah, that's 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 exactly what you need, man. Because, you know, it, there's always things that you know that we need that we need touching up on it. Plus, I just think it's good reading. What a cool last name! I don't think I've ever heard that last name before. David Sonbolian. That is a cool name. Hmm. Hello, Spencer. Thank you for your wonderful videos. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, teaching us all about watches, specifically Seiko's. My question is, how would you preserve a quartz watch? Would you pull out the crown and stop the watch from ticking? Or would you remove the back and take out the battery? Thank you, Spencer. Uh, it depends on the watch. Um, if you... Uh, 
like the 754 X's. Um, they have a they have a circuit cut out basically. So you pull the crown, and in theory, it, it, it cuts this. It physically stops the train. You pull the hacking lever comes in, stops the train. But it also has a another part of that lever that comes over and, and it goes underneath the circuit. This post that it's around, it goes click, and it, it cuts the power. Um, so in theory, in that case, if you pull the crown all the way out the battery will be disconnected from the circuit and everything stops. However, I'm not a big fan of leaving batteries and watches that are unattended. Uh, I mean, if you're gonna wear the watch every, you know, once every couple, three weeks or something like that, who cares if it's in the thing? If you're putting it away, like you're putting it away, you're not gonna be wearing it, I would just pull the battery. Because um, if the, if the, if the, you know, the seals fail in the battery and you start getting this just hideously corrosive alkaline garbage, just, it, the damage can be just indescribable. There's no benefit that I'm aware of, of continuing to run a quartz watch that you're not ever going to wear. Um, that's, that's my input. That's my input. Key to the universe. Hey Spencer, hope you're doing well. You know, I'm getting through it. Um, if you have a moment, I'm a little bit confused, but my 6139 7002 chapter ring doesn't sit flush and it rattles around the case. I can't get it to sit right, so I was just wondering if you knew how to fix it. Well, I happen to have a Seiko 7002 case. I, I do. I have, a, I have a few of them uh, that I was going to fiddle around with. Um, one thing that would be helpful is making sure that you have the, the correct chapter ring, though, before I go and start pulling stuff apart. Those early 6139-7000s versus the later ones, because those were some of the early ones that were produced, but they continued making them, they transitioned between the A and the B movements. The A version of the movement is lower stack. It doesn't stand as high. The, the B um, is, is taller. And so Seiko, with those watches, there's a number of things under the... It's like you've got the, you've got the chapter ring, and then you have the... the it's like the seal. It's, it, it's, it's, it's another ring that the seal sits in. It's like the, it's like the gasket supporting ring. And that goes in there. Uh, and then you're, you, you put in your glass and then the bezel snaps on top. Because of the difference in the heights of the movements, um, there's a, there are different heights of like, like almost all that stuff, but especially the, um, especially that gasket ring that I'm talking about. Um, it is, they had them in short versions and they had them in slightly taller versions. You can tell because the short versions are pretty, pretty square profile. The taller versions are rounded, the bottom edge is rounded, uh, and it's a, a, a tiny, tiny amount of difference. I mean, like half a millimeter. Um, and so you have to really, you have to measure them up to figure out which is which, and make sure that you've got the right one. So that is the first thing I would do, is to ascertain if your, if your piece is early or late. Um, if it's original, how does it look? Um, does it have an A or a B movement in it? Uh, when was the watch made? That kind of stuff. Because it's right at that period when the switch from the early ones to the later ones that the Seiko did all this stuff with these things with the rotating rings and the chapter rings and stuff where they were different heights and different things. It's 6139's the same way. Um, heck, the early sport divers, like the early um, like rally divers and stuff like that, the 70 meter UFO style round divers, they all went through the same thing. They had early dial rings and late dial rings. They had early internal rotating rings and later ro internal rotating rings. And they won't swap. They won't swap. The, the, you have to make sure that the, a later part didn't sneak into an earlier watch or vice versa. Hmm. Mr. Bun913. As much as I'm a Seiko fan, oh, okay. Right. This is a question or a statement. Okay, 
This is a question or statement about the new, uh, like, uh, chronographs that Seiko put out, the ones that reference the 6139 speed timers. Um, and it is, uh, they, they said, okay, well, in order to honor this thing, you know, this 6139 speed timer, here are these new chronographs and all this other stuff. But it, they don't have anything to, they don't seem to have anything to do with the, that chronograph is a totally different movement. Aesthetically, the watches are completely different. They don't look like a 6139 at all. They're all multi-registered, using a completely different kind of movement. Um, the only one of the four variants that bears any resemblance whatsoever to the speed timer, there's one of those new chronographs, uses the same color scheme as a 6139, like this. It uses that dark blue and the red and that kind of stuff, but that's that's it. The, after that, the resemblance ends. It's like when, you, um, who was it? It was it. Uh, I forget who made them, but anyway, uh, for Sears, for their tradition line of watches, way back in the day, they wanted something like this. Sears did. They wanted to sell something like this, but they couldn't get this movement, and so they actually made a line of weird knockoffs of these with a Valju 7750 in them. And so they're they're super cool, but they are they're, they're, it's not it's not a it's not a Seiko in 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 any way, but that watch, those Sears tradition Valju 7750 powered you know aesthetic copies of these things are way closer to being a Seiko than anything Seiko produced to you know, to demonstrate a connection to the, um, to demonstrate a connection to the, the original 6139 JDM speed timer. Okay, so you've gotten all that background, right? So, now on to the comment. As much as I'm a Seiko fan, that new chrono is pretty silly. I made a comment elsewhere about how ridiculous it looks, let alone that it has nothing in common with original speed timers. If you're going to model it on a stopwatch like that, then why not make it a bullhead? I read this sentence and I'm like, why didn't they make it a bullhead? They had one of these watches used the face of a, of a stopwatch, of a 1964 Seiko stopwatch. Okay, the stopwatch was a bullhead. Seiko has a, has a history of making bullheads. They have a tradition of bullheads. Uh, but they then took this watch, which was a stopwatch, which was a bullhead, so, and they instead rotated it so the buttons were on the side normally because they didn't want to make a whole new case, um, I guess. And so they just used an existing case and made a dial that referenced it because that'd be the easy thing to do rather than really going for it. Any case, if you're going to model it on a stopwatch like that, then why not make it a bullhead? That might have looked really good with those pushers too. It, yeah, it was a clean design. The reissues seem like it's just putting them putting it's just them putting the back catalog. Sorry. The reissues seem like it's just them putting the back catalog up on a wall and throwing darts. The original, coherent, and beautiful design language they were known for just becomes gibberish. I hate to think what they will charge when they eventually do a proper poke reissue, and it will probably be limited to five pieces anyway. I have no faith that Seiko is capable. No, that's not true. They're entirely capable. They could reproduce a 6139 one-to-one. -one. I have absolutely no doubt for at all. They could absolutely do it one-to-one -to, -one to the point that the parts exchange. I'm absolutely sure they can do it. If, you know, Colt was able to do it with the 911, uh, which they were, which they did uh, before they went out of business, um, Seiko can absolutely, absolutely do it. They could do it. I mean, imagine if they made a super push. They were like, every, all these other weird little watches and other projects, all that stops. We are, re we are recreating the 6139. They could totally do it. But you're correct. They charged like... Three grand for it? If it was one to one? God, can you imagine if they made a one to one reissue of the actual True Poke? They could literally do it. I don't know. I don't know. That'd be really interesting. There'd be a lot of philosophical debates about whether anything like that would be considered valid. Oh, it's wacky. 
Adrian Hargreaves. Hi Spencer, I've been looking at the new chronos from Seiko this week and to me it's just a letdown. I'm not interested in solar watches unless it's a G-Shock and they are overpriced. Oh well, I agree. Oh yeah. They're definitely, they're a lot of money. Seiko's not, I mean they're trying to get a new client base I guess, but they're, they were, they were a high quality, not priced high watch. They were great bang for the buck. Um, I, I still don't know what their long-term plan is, but that's not my job to figure that out, and they wouldn't tell me if I wanted to. I don't mind solar watches, actually, uh, personally. Um, Seiko's mechanical quartzes, you know, like the early AGSs, you know, the kinetics, that kind of stuff, they have a weight that turns around. I've never liked that technology. Uh, it just seems overly complex, and their charging and power reserve technologies for that just are they're still terrible. Um, they say it's a six month charge at full thing. I've never seen it, not even from new. But I mean, three, four weeks after a full charge, it'll be down to saying that you've got a maybe a month left. Um, but the solar tech is really good. And it's my understanding that this is the solar tech that was developed by Citizen. Uh, and Citizen's stuff is really, really good. Like the the power units, the power generation um, from Citizen, they project that their power cells in their solar watches will be still effective to 80% after 20 years. I absolutely, I, that's awesome. That's just fantastic. So it's one of the reasons that Astron, Solar Astron, I consider that, you know, depending on the price point, I'd be I'd be curious about it if I was going to go on a on a long trip. You know, I would absolutely think about it. So I like solar, but not for that price. <sighs> Mihai Pascu, hi Spencer, can you show what you do if you have large accuracy deviation between positions? Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Um, it's not really, it's not really showing anything. I can see it in my mind. There's a bunch of different reasons that can happen. Typically, you're going to have a pivot is worn on one side or the other. And so if you dial up and something runs really well, and then you turn it so it's dialed down and it stops running really well, then something obviously is moving too much. And so you have to stop. You have to you have to try to figure out basically how to how to how to stop it. You have to look first at your at your balance, make sure the balance is okay. Look at it carefully and see if it's floating or if it's wobbling like this. Hmm? You have to do the same thing with your uh, pallet fork. You have to make sure that it's you know I've had them where they're 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 moving up and down a lot. Next thing to look at. Okay, but if those two things are tight and you've removed them and you've made sure that there's no like lubrication where there shouldn't be, there's pallet fork pivots should not ever have, um, they almost never are lubricated. So that's something to check to make sure. But you just, you want to make sure they have a little bit of up and down, a little bit of room to move, but not too much. Okay. But if your pallet fork and your, um, Balance are fine. You got to pull those. Then you're starting to look at the wheels. Okay, because clearly something is touching. Something is wrong. And so you're going to have to then look and see. Look at all the wheels. Looking through the middle of your the plates, the movement. You, you look and see if you're getting up and down. You're look and see if you've got worn pivots. You got some lash stuff going on. You got to check that. If you find a wheel is moving around a lot. Okay, great. You got to then pull the rest of the movement apart, and you have to pull that wheel and look at it really closely, ascertain if it's a, the wheel or the pivots, or is it that you have, um, is it that you have like a, a worn out bushing? Do you have a cracked jewel? Um, is there too much space on the jewel? So the jewels are fine, the pivots are fine, but the jewel needs to be dropped in a little bit to make sure that you tighten that up. Um, but it can also be other things. It can be things like, uh, I worked on a watch once for, God, it was weeks of work. 
uh, and it just I couldn't get it figured out. And then the 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 owner tells me, "Oh yeah, by the way, there was this family rumor that the watch got stepped on by a horse." Um, and then I looked really closely at the main plate, and it was bent. The main plate was bent. Um, so that's another thing. It's it's just you have to keep. It's all about problem solving. You have to keep taking the thing apart, breaking it down to isolate areas and to try to figure out where that problem might be. But I will give you a great piece of advice uh, that has worked for me and I came up with this advice for myself to stop myself from making my own life harder. Fix one problem at a time. Don't try to fix three things. Oh, you know, like going in there like, hey, you know, I'm not sure about the pallet fork. It might be good, but uh, I'm not sure if I'll replace it anyway. And I'm also going to replace this wheel and that wheel and adjust adjust this jewel. Well, maybe the watch will run better or maybe it won't run any better, but you don't, you don't know which thing you did made it better or worse or didn't change anything. So fix one thing at a time. Oh, oh, oh. Um... There's actually, instead of, also, there is another thing, and I keep forgetting about this. Let's see, I want to pause, and let me pull out the Seiko catalog. Uh, not catalog, the Seiko servicing guide. I want to show you something. Okay. So you get out your handy-dandy Seiko, Seiko servicing guide, right? And it says uh, we've got, the thing not only has explanation of cap calibers, but it gives you basic instructions. What is Diaflex? What is Diaflex? Diashock. Um, cleaning of parts, oiling, repairing instruments, and testing machines. One section one, page thirteen. Here are all the different pictures of all the relative, you know, all the mentioned calibers. Talking about items common to all Seikos, including we got Diashock. It's got this beautiful cutaway illustration. Isn't that neat? It shows you everything. It shows you how much to oil. Instead of giving you numbers, it actually shows you. It shows you what the final thing is supposed to look like. It's, it's actually, it's really cool. I'm trying to think. What, you won't go down any further? Okay. Yeah, I love it. I love the breakaways. So you can see, that, so we have your dye fix here. You can see how this thing works, how you're supposed to take it apart. You see these kind of horseshoe ones. These are re these ones are really, really small. Uh, you see these on ladies' movements. And anyway, that tells you how to do it. You don't have to wonder. There it is. There's your oil it, and you get to see it. Diaflex, mainspring, tells you about the mainspring, tells you about the stuff. Look at this internal looks, how the mainspring looks itself. Hand winders. Cleaning of parts, it tells you every single piece, how you're supposed to do it. Differential wheel roller, lock and wheel, escape wheel and pinion. You rinse it with benzene. About five minutes. You don't put alcohol because the alcohol will melt the shellac. That keeps a lot of the stuff together. You don't do that. Um, do you know oil? What? I don't believe that for a minute. Are you freaking non... What? Due to oil retaining treatment, never use brush or ultrasonic washing method. I mean, okay, so I, I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, that's something I adhere for Swiss watches. These guys, I don't know that they did that, so I, I will have to double check. Uh, let's see, casing tools. We got us a tester. I have one of these testers up in the attic. I haven't used it in years, years and years and years. I should, I should sell it to somebody. Auto cleaners. Let's see how to run your cleaner, how to get your your baskets and put your stuff together, the processes you're supposed to use. Seiko time grapher. So here's the deal. So you're here looking at this. Would you knock it off? Uh, you're here looking at this thing. Hey, look at that. Here's your pillar wheel. Hmm. Uh, what, what in the ugh? Come on. Okay. Over, over, over. Hey, look, greases. Okay, how much oil you're supposed to use, what kinds of greases you're supposed to use, where and when you're supposed to use them. Mm-hmm, yeah. Winding mechanisms, setting mechanisms for the S4. S3, lubricating oil for slipping attachments of the automatic winding mainspring with 
a black mark on the barrel. Some of them have a black mark. Somebody was like, recently was like, why are you using S2? Why don't you use S3? S3 is for something else. S2 is lubricating oil for slipping attachments to the automatic winding mainspring without a black mark on the barrel cover. Um, like uh, 5126s, I think, have that black ring. Okay, so time grapher. We're listening. The great thing about this manual is it tells us, it shows you the tracks. This is the old paper track, right? But this is the same thing that you see on the time grapher. It's just sideways. So when you're looking at your, your modern time grapher, you're looking at this and you can see how stuff is, you can see the problems and it tells you a lot of the things and after a while you can see it. Um, it's just, it, you know, some of this stuff, like I, for me, you know, this, this sort of, sort of bad, uh, let's see, figures. This graph paper used in this test measure, you know, daily rate, each column, each column represents 10 seconds. There's one that actually a long time ago totally cleared up an issue for me, which was um, 13. This, oh, was it knocking? No, 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 no. But if you look, it shows you these different readouts and it tells you what the cause might be. This recording resulted from an inadequate oscillation of balance wheel from about 100 degrees, about 100 degrees of oscillation. That's, which is barely, barely, barely running. And it tells you all the different things and it's great. And you can compare it to what you're seeing on your screen and it'll give you a, 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 a hand. Look at this 18, look at this weird thing. You're like zoop, zoop. Unevenness of fourth wheel teeth. And so, you know what you're doing, you see this, you're like, oh. Uh, shows a sudden change in oscillation of the balance wheel, basically amplitude changes caused by touching of the second hand with, oh, wow. Oh, I was reading about the wrong one. 10, 15 is the uneven, unevenness of escape wheel teeth, where you're seeing this weird, weird, choppy, crunchy thing. This is really cool. One of the most mysterious problems is uh, hand interference. Uh, okay, this shows a sudden change in oscillation of the balance wheel caused by the touching of the second hand with the glass once around. The same result would appear if teeth of the fourth wheel were uneven. Isn't it great? I don't have to remember all this stuff. It's right here. You can see you got more of them. Magnetized. This watch ticks 5.5 ticks per second, but was not measured with the crystal selector switch at 19,800 beats. Ooh, 25, oiled hairspring. Everything's all sticking together. Anyway, I wish Seiko would reissue this stuff or put it in a physical form, you know, or, or you know, heck, have a scan of everything. If I, had an, if I had an intern, I'd have somebody scan this whole thing and I'd put the whole darn thing online, but... Okay. Yeah, so that, that really helps, too, because then I, th I personally think that being able to look at the lines coming out of the time grapher, it, and, and it will, you know, once you learn to read it a little bit, and there are certain things you can look at it and be like, oh, well, this is probably, you, know, you can kind of visualize a little bit better, which is not a bad thing, and it certainly helped me. VB, mail call is pretty cool. Thank you. I usually only catch the restorations. I'm glad you're watching anything, thank you. Are larger balances more difficult to maintain and or more often go out of round? Not really. Uh, for a balanced, I mean, balances are, you know, they're, they're, they're a wheel, they are a series of arches, they are, they're quite strong. Um, they're quite strong. So for a balance to have to literally go out around, it needs to be physically damaged, like squished or pushed down or bent in some way. Um, the thing with bigger balances, like the Omega Speedmaster, the classic Speedy, those things, they use these big balances and that was kind of the standard at the time, those big Omega balances. The Seiko 6139, 6138 chronograph balances are almost identical. They're the same size. 
the thing with the bigger a balance you've got, the more oomph you've got to put into them to be able to get them to spin up to the correct amplitude. They have more positional stability, I believe is the thing. It's like, you know, just like a bicycle will keep itself up, right? You're bicycling and the wheels are turning, motorcycle or whatever. It's the same thing with a balance is you've got, it's going to have this gyroscopic positional stability and the further out you, you go, that's going to be a pretty strong force. Um, so what problems that can come up with, especially in like Seiko 6139s, the balance doesn't become a problem. What becomes a problem is that you have to use a lot, you have to have a strong mainspring with a lot of force pushing through the train to, to spin the balance up to that speed. And as we see in a lot of these, this era of Seikos, with the lower mainspring arbor only just, it's just, it's a stainless steel mainspring arbor sitting in a hole in the brass main plate. That's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of power and that barrel is turning and it's pushing and it's pushing back the other way. And that lower mainspring arbor will just grind its way sideways through the plate. So that is, that's, that's the consequence in this case. And it's not necessarily a design, something inherently bad about big balances. What it says is that Seiko decided not to spend 10 cents or whatever to put, to put in a barrel in those lower mainspring, to put in a jewel in the lower mainspring arbor. Uh, uh, it would have, I can't even imagine how far that would have extended the life of these things. Um, you know, you can get, you know, I just did a 6309 the other day that had, it looked, it looked like it'd seen a summer's worth of use. And it was, I mean, a beautiful, beautiful watch. And yet the lower mainspring arbor port was terribly worn. Um, I sometimes think Seiko did it deliberately, but I think a lot of things. Um, oh, to contrast that, the 7000 series, like 7S26 and stuff like that, much smaller balance. Um, and they have, it is extremely rare to see a 7000 series with lower mainspring arbor wear. I mean, you, sometimes you can see a little bit, they have to have been really, really, really worked hard for that to happen. It's just not something you see very often. So there you go. That's part of it. Uh, I have to go let the cat out. Watch me draw. Thanks for the tip for what to use for restoring a dial. I'm an artist and I never thought of using something like that. It only worked for me because I was desperately trying to think about what I could do to deal with, you know, surface loss on a, uh, on a dial. And I'm like, well, this is kind of the same scale even, like working on a model. Uh, and if I needed to have a model that needed to have a, a decal set down or something changed or the, the refractory nature of how the model itself looked, I would go to think about, you know, what oversprays do I have that can change, you know, absorption and, and satin versus gloss or whatever. That was the first thought I thought of. And it just, it worked. I had to experiment. I had to like, I had to throw the dice. Um, I did it. And even with that, I mean, each piece is very different. Every dial is very different. Thanks to the, uh, seriously, I'm going to be done with this video and I'm going to go and trim trim that off. It's driving me nuts. So this I'm going to call the pokey beard video. Uh, oh, this is still talking about the chronographs. Also, Seiko can do a proper 6139 homage and fans would gobble it off if done properly. Of course they would. Absolutely. Back in the time when the speed timer was created, it was revolutionary. But we've come so far, so it shouldn't be too difficult to do a mechanical version new using a newer movement, perhaps with a module. I like EcoDrive and Solar, but I would rather fully rather have a fully mechanical for something like a 6139 homage. It's like Honda coming out with a 1971 Honda CB250 K1 homage that is electric. It's not the same at all. And correct, and as I replied to you, to, in my mind, the first thing that came to mind is like, this is like the new Beetle. Uh, it's like vaguely Beetle-shaped, but besides that, it has nothing to do with the original air-cooled Volkswagen. Nothing. Jeff Koritsky. 
Hi Spencer. Hello, Jeff. Thank you for your videos. You're welcome. I am attempting some very basic watch repairs. I attempt things all the time. I purchased a used Seiko 150 meter diver 7N33, uh, 6AB something. And unfortunately, the case tube is stripped and I cannot screw down the crown. Can you please tell me if the case tubes on these older watches are removable? I can tell you, yes, if they are removable. They are not removable. See? Ring? Always correct. Always proud of that. Um, it depends how... When you say stripped, I've seen stripped. Like, like, not that you haven't seen stripped, but when I hear stripped, I think about what I've seen in the past, which is that the, the crown that threads on the case tube are not just rounded over or kind of blurred looking, but they're like gone. Um, if you look at your threads and you can see that they're still evenly spaced all the way around, uh, they're just maybe rounded over a little bit, um, you might be okay. You need to, the first thing I want to do is get another crown. Basically a new crown. Sometimes a new crown with worn but not truly really damaged case threads, a new crown, if you're careful, sometimes will cure your problem. So it just depends how bad the threads are. Um, I have been able to clear bad threads in the past every now and then. It, it, in conjunction sometimes also with a new crown. It just, it just depends. But for a 7 and 3, 3, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, the case tubes, the way that Seiko apparently seems to have done them, give your case, you drill your hole for the crown. Seiko had a one-piece thing, it's a piece of tubing, and it's squished, and it's got a threaded section, and then it's got a, another tube that goes in through the case. They put it into the case, and then apparently... I have been told by people who were engineers and have looked at the cases more closely, Seiko then electrically welded them in place, basically running current through so where the tube meets the case, it goes <clears throat> and it welds itself in place. I mean, in theory, if you had the replacement tube, if you had the complete replacement tube somehow, or somebody made one, you could get rid of the old crown tube. Heck, you could probably do it even with just like a hand brooch. It wouldn't be You'd have to be super careful, but if you were able to use a brooch and very carefully physically extract the old crown tube as metal shavings, if you got the thing right, you could then, in theory, put the new tube in. I'm not exactly sure how you would give it any kind of water tightness or correctness. Um, I don't know, but I mean, it's possible. It'd be a lot of work, though. It'd be easier just to find another case, honestly, or probably another watch. Hmm. Michael Matera. Spencer, thanks for doing another mail call video. Well, thank you for watching it. Uh, it's the only reason I make them is that you watch them. You folks didn't want to watch these things anymore. Well, I might still make videos, but probably shorter ones. I wanted to comment on a subject that seemed to get a lot of comments. Wink emoji. If you were to ever start taking in new work, and at some point... I had you work on one of my watches. I would politely ask that you hum while you work on it. <laughs> okay. I feel like I wouldn't be getting the full Spencer attention if, if, if you're always worrying about not upsetting someone about humming. So I guess you know where I stand on the noises and such in your videos. It's what makes your videos real, at least in my opinion anyway. I like seeing real life, not polished gloss. We have enough of that elsewhere. Thanks for giving your time and sharing your skills and knowledge. Have a great week or weekend. Well, thank you. I appreciate all of that. Um... I, I don't know, it just, it's, if stuff to me seems extra or extra work for no real good reason except like, I don't know, I don't know, I, 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 if I can't come up with a rationale for why taking the time to do something is a better use of the time than simply ignoring it, then, um, I don't know. I mean, I just don't even, it's, it's not important. I can't, I understand that it bothers some people, but for me, it's not what I'm here for. It's not what any of us are here for. We want to talk watches. We want to look at watches and talk about knowledge and discuss repair. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not here to 
blow time to be slick and try to make it all nice with, you know, graphics and edited sound and humorous outtakes and all that stuff. I, I, I don't have time for that. I don't care. It's not important. The, the information matters. Everything else is secondary. Um, and that's, that's how I think. I don't, I don't watch any like the super professional watch videos because a lot of time they're, they're stuffed with filler that I just, I just don't care about. I just, I don't even bother. Um, not that I'm right, but that does for me. BT Mantras. Oh my God, another watch nerd. Hi. I just learned from you that this watch is a module chronograph. The gentleman was making a comment on the uh, on the SRQ031 that I own. Uh, I don't I don't wear it because it's too it's brand new. I can't bring myself to wear it uh, because I might put a mark on it. I, I think I've I've worn it maybe for a few hours one afternoon. So I'm not wearing this. Not because I don't like it, but because I don't want to scratch it. I don't want to commit to this thing being mine. So this is on the website for like 25% off um, retail. I, I think I've worn it for a couple of hours. And it came to me brand new from, uh, a I think it was Arizona Fine Time. Brand new. It's a pretty, pretty watch. It is a pretty, pretty watch. God, I haven't looked at this thing in months. That is a pretty, pretty watch. Huh. Okay, well, let me get back to the question. Um, I just learned from you that this is a module chrono, and that makes sense since the minutes and hours registers operate independently of the sweep seconds. I have no idea. That's that's pretty neat. Pretty neat to know. Gosh, that really is a pretty watch. Oh right, and it's got this dome. It's got this crystal that looks like it's an acrylic, so it'd be like old school, but it's actually made of uh, glass, tempered glass. <laughs> um. Anyway, I'm sorry. Back to BG, BT Mantras. I was contemplating getting this, but got instead the SRQ033. Porco Rosso, and not sorry I did. Red Pig? I, my, I mean, obviously my Italian is immaculate, but I, I might have this wrong. Like its namesake, it is a Porky watch. It's not a red Porky watch, uh, which shares the 8R48 movement. Love your review and watch. Thumbs up. Well, great. Thank you. I did not. It never occurred to me about that with the hours and things and the stuff with the things. I, I did not know. That's pretty wacky. Mark T. I bought a Seiko Sarba 017. This is the green alpinist, the classic alpinist. I bought a Seiko Sarba 017 with the 6R15D movement for my 60th birthday. After 18 months, it began stopping with shallow amplitude, erratic seconds per day values on the time grapher. I demagnetized it about 10 times with no change, regulated it, still no change. To say I'm disappointed is very much an understatement. I, oh, mail's coming. Honey? I'm, I hope she heard it. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll wait and see if I hear the door open. Maybe I did or didn't. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I every time I've run into a watch like yours uh, with one of these later movements and it's doing exactly what yours does and they seem to do them, I, I don't even know what the percentage is, actually. I can't say, but in every case, when I have serviced one of those new watches that doesn't run well, I have found that it was a lubrication issue. Uh, specifically, it's like... Incorrect lubrication, too much lubrication in places, no or not enough lubrication in others, lubrication in the wrong places. I have repeatedly found that the pallet fork pivots uh, had oil on them, which they're absolutely not supposed to have. Cleaning off the lubrication off of the pallet fork pivots and then the pallet fork jewels, making sure that those things are not lubricated, um, will go a 
hugely long way towards fixing almost anything. The other issue is that the balances, because of how they do their diachron or whatever the heck it is, they have, they don't, the, the stud especially is not firmly fixed like it is in the earlier ones, and it can move around in the balance, the arms, as can the other one, and they have adjustments for twisting, so you can, you can do a lot of um, adjustments to the hairspring. But it also means it's real easy to jack it up. Um, and that's another thing too. So unfortunately, I mean, they can be dialed in, but it takes a lot of troubleshooting and work to do it. And it shouldn't happen. But it goes back to Seiko and, you know, the, their philosophy. I mean, they wouldn't put in a few pennies worth of cost lower mainspring Arbor Jewel in their entire 6,000 series watches, except for the 6,100 high beats. You know, they didn't do that. They made that choice deliberately. So to save a little bit of money, they may be saving a little bit of money on their lubricating machine. And maybe it works 80% of the time and it's great. And then, you know, the other 20, they're all duds, but you know, watch wasn't that expensive. And people, maybe they'll buy another Seiko. I don't know. That's very cynical of me, but... Okay, now these comments are about the beautiful 6309 I restored, finished, and posted yesterday. Very nice. These Hong Kong dials normally do not have Japan on the case back. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's the thing. That's, that's why I'm thinking that it was like my Hong Kong Sua, it's one of the really early transition pieces made in spring, summer 1981, which is when those, the factory, the production was being moved. And my Hong Kong Sua has had, well, no, it does still have, it, it was basically brand new. And it had a sticker on the case back that said, assembled in Hong Kong from Japanese parts or Japanese parts assembled in Hong Kong or something. And I think this watch was that same thing. I think that was a, you know, or even that the, the blank for the case back before the serial number got dropped into it. Um, maybe the case backs were made in Japan and then blank ones were shipped over down to Hong Kong and then they put the serial numbers on them and cranked them out. That's my theory. But it's very, very pretty. This comment is actually from the owner. You know, I'm going to get the watch hang on. Hope I freaked out some people. Oh, that hum was enough to set my ear off. Wacky. Anyway, here's the watch. This gentleman's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful 6309. Oh. <gasps> look at look at the look, wait, where are the crowns? Look at the time. It's so strange that sometimes I've owned so many of these in all levels of condition and they're just, they, they, they just feel different. Sometimes different examples of the same model to me, some there's, they, 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 they feel kind of neutral. I'm just like, whatever, they're not attractive. It's just a watch, a thing. Sometimes they're, they feel bad to me. It's very strange. I know it sounds spiritual, but it, it, it's not. I, I must, there's something about the watch on some level in terms of condition that I'm picking up on. I don't know what. But then there are some watches that feel good to me. I look at them and I'm like, this is a good watch. And when I say this is a good watch, it means that it's not only reliable and dependable and is doing what it wants to do and is serviced or, or not serviced, but that there's, it's just... It's, it's a watch that I want to wear. I see it and I'm like, that's a good watch. I would wear that watch. This is a good 6309. That's a nice piece. Oh, except I have the date set wrong. <sighs> anyway, the owner of that watch, Wyoming Yeti. This watch came to me from a widow so, selling it on eBay. The crown was unscrewed, so I think it stayed for years in a sock drawer with the crown out. 
A lot of folks say service a watch only when it stops running correctly. People do say that. But by then your parts are worn out and parts may not be available. True. That's certainly true with this one. Uh, I wholeheartedly believe sending both watches in was the right choice. Save me saw it in 2028. That does great things for my heart. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I was honored to see it. It's a beautiful piece. It's a beautiful piece, and I really, truly do believe this is another Hong Kong Sua. If you had asked me, that's what I'd say. I can't, I can't prove it, except for the fact that K-Spec says Japan, but I would call it Hong Kong Sua too. Uh, oh, and it's going to be a lot quicker than 2028 that I'm going to be taking new jobs. Like I said, I'm, I'm down to three customers. I'm, I'm almost down to the bottom. Tom N. Hi, Spencer. I was just watching a YouTube video on the new Bulova Mill Ships Diver reissue. It has a true moisture indicator on the dial that turns color with water contacting it, just like the original. This got me thinking about how the Seiko loom from the 60s and 70s turns black with moisture. Do you think that was intentional, at least on their divers? No, I don't think that was intentional. Um... I think it was just a side effect of the materials that they chose to use, especially their loom, being salt-based um, and not sealed. And so the salt will, you know, pull moisture to it. Have you ever, you know, it, for those of you who live in a cold climate where it snows, if you have ever had, like, road salt, right, you know, to, like, salt the sidewalk or something like that, middle of summer, you're not using the stuff at all. You go out to the shed or... You know, you're you're out, you know, in the garage, and you, there's the bag of salt, and you got to move it, and you pick it up, and underneath it, and there's been no water in the garage, especially here, it's a desert. Pick it up, and there will be it, the, the the concrete will be wet underneath the bag, even though the salt is in plastic. Um, salt just pulls the water right to it. I think it's, I think what's probably likely is that they decided to use a moisture indicator that uses a similar process to the accidental process that happens when loom gets wet. But I don't know. George Sisterhen. Or is that George Cistern? You'll have to tell me how to pronounce that. Quick question. Was there a March 1971 Notch case 6139 gold dial resist 6002 or 6005. Not that I'm aware of. When was the 6139 notch case phased out? Thanks, George. Uh, well, this, okay, for example, this here, this is a notch case. This is the American notch resist 6139 6009. This is from the earliest one I've seen that I can remember was set was no it was July of 1969 that's real early and the notch cases is what these came with the latest notches I can remember were like July 70 I think I, I it, like right about that thing this one is look at this thing um, this one is this one is March 1970 I have um, I have others that are in that same time period, like March 1970, April 1970, and again, I've seen one, I think, as late as July 1970, but I, I can't firmly remember. The only notch gold dial I can't, gold dials that I can, gold dial that I can remember is the 6139-6000, those gold dials. Um... Because even like the 6139-6001s, uh, they had, you know, the, the two-piece sweep, the early gold dials, they had the two-piece sweep, everything that would have been super early. But it, they had the later style non-notch case. Though they would have a lower A-type case back. I don't know, it was wild. Um, there's no, like, so this, 6139-6009, the notch case, this was the American only version of this and it only came in this dark configuration there was no gold version of this i don't know why you'd think 
I, I don't know why. I wonder why. But there was no gold version of this. I wish there were. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool? So, wow. Uh, Mohammed Haji. Hello, Spencer. Thank you for sharing again. Thank you for commenting again. I was wondering where I can get an original sweep seconds hand for a JDM 6138-0011 UFO model, a.k.a. the Yachtman. I damaged the paint on mine when I was tinkering with it. My OCD is killing me about it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing this at you. I'm doing this for you. Because I have been in that position. How bad is the damage? How big is the chip? Do you still have the chip? If you chip a hand like that and it's not too bad and you can get the chip, even if it's small, it is possible to put it back on. I've done it. Um, you have to get clear coat, like a clear lacquer, model lacquer, tiny amount of it, tiny, tiny amount of it, and even that ever so slightly thinned down, and you get where the chip paint is supposed to go on the hand, and you, you get the clear coat there. And then you take Rotico. You don't want to put pressure on that paint chip when it's loose. Try to pick it up with tweezers, you're either going to crush it or it's going to, and it's going to go away. You get Rotico and you get it down to just a really fine, feathery, fine point. Just enough in the very tip you pick up that tiny piece of paint and you very carefully maneuver it down until the chip contacts the clear um, coat that is sitting on that spot. Surface tension will grab the chip and go then, if you get something like a, again, like a round toothpick, something non-scratchy, wooden, um, not even metal, uh, maybe even something plastic, but very, very, very fine, and you very, very gently, if you need to, maneuver that paint chip into place until you can get it to where it locks in and drops in, and you can, as the clear coat dries, the volume drops drastically, and it will, it will kind of pull everything in. Um, in a perfect world, that's what happens. Trying to get a hand replacement? Um, I don't know, there's a dude in Arizona called like Scotch Pines Watch Parts. Sometimes he has things, but honestly, really, especially for an early, early two-part sweep like that, they've been gone for so long, your best bet is to try to fix the hand. Seriously, try to try to fix the paint. Um, if you don't have the paint chip, you can, you know, get your model paints out. You know, everybody has their box of model paints and thinners and, you know, really fine brushes, and you can do your best to, to color match. You don't necessarily have to repaint the entire hand. If that, if it's small enough, and you can get the color match in, again, you thin it down a lot, you get that color match paint, you drop it in and surface tension will pull it where it's supposed to go. But I don't know. It depends. I, I would need to know how bad it was. But replacement is going to be like your last option because they're so hard to find. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, my heart, seriously, I, my heart hurts for you. Last one. J-R-R-D-L-W. Good day, Spencer. Hey, I said I didn't even mean to say that, and I said it. You'll have to tell me how I did. Um, would like to thank you for speaking so openly about ADHD. Well, you're welcome. I wish I'd known earlier. So I'm hoping that if I talk about it, maybe somebody else will say, Oh my god, so that's what's happening. I'm currently in the early stages of getting a diagnosis, and it has forced me to look back into past events, like you said, and sort of realizing that it might have been missed because I often didn't fit the stereotype of the little boy who can't, couldn't sit still in class. I agree that it's a deeply misunderstood condition, and it's important that we have this conversation to bring greater level of understanding about it. I, I, I absolutely could not agree more. Uh, it's... Uh, I read a thing actually yesterday about ADHD is that part of the problem is not just physical structure differences in the brain that that sort of hijack or 
or undercut executive function, it also has to deal with um, uh, serotonin production or um, and it's this it's it's like your brain. You, I mean, normal people you get up in the morning and you're you're going to do the things you like to do. You're going to get your bowl of cereal, turn on Bugs Bunny, or go out and pick up the paper. You know, do whatever, whatever you're doing. Normal for normal people, a simple pleasant activity like that give you a little little shot up, feel a little bit better. Hey, things are going okay. That does not happen necessarily with people with ADHD. Um, uh, among the many other things that are terribly wrong. Doing normal things that people have to do normally, like normal work stuff or things that aren't necessarily in my, you know, my main area of interest, like math or taxes or something like that, I, I can't make myself pay any attention to it. No, can't do it at all. The And part of the reason for that is because my brain is not giving me any incentive to do it. There's no pleasure, no, nothing comes from doing this stuff. It's just annoying and terrible and I have to force myself to go through this thing and it is it, it's exhausting it's mentally and emotionally exhausting to sit there and force myself to go through this stuff and my brain is doing everything it can to try to find serotonin and it sure as heck isn't finding serotonin doing whatever task it is that I'm doing and so that's you can't concentrate you can't your, your brain is like stimulate me stimulate me um, and it just it just doesn't work out if I enjoy a subject I would do great. And this, I always thought that that made me, you know, that was kind of like my special thing. That's an ADHD thing. Um, you're good at the subjects that you enjoy. The subjects you don't enjoy, you're not good at them. Um, you can't even make yourself good at them if it's bad enough. You can try, you can push as hard as you want to, but you, your own system is fighting you and your system wants the serotonin and you're gonna go off and find a way to get that serotonin however you can, including doing really stupid things because your executive function is malfunctioning and your system is dying for serotonin, you make really stupid decisions for the, the wrong things. And especially when like you're, you're a boy or a young man, you make really stupid, stupid decisions and your motivations don't make sense to anybody around you. And even you don't understand why it's happening this way. Um, it's it, it can be a life-destroying thing because then it gets all wrapped up in people around you saying, "Why are you lazy? Why don't you work harder? Why don't you? Why can't you concentrate? Why don't you know what I just said? Please repeat what I just said back to you." And you're like, "I don't fucking know." Sorry, bad language. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know why. And it's just like. And so you internalize this stuff that you're some kind of weird screw up, or loser who can't. Who it doesn't have the moral strength to master yourself. And get with the program. It's not how ADHD works. It's not how that works. You can't force yourself to have to become a good responsible person. It's not the way it works. Um, so you have to be aware of it, you have to learn about it, you have to understand what your brain is doing, what it's not doing, you have to, you have to, you have to deal with the ignorance of the people around you who think that you're just, you know, you having ADHD means you're kind of fidgety. They don't understand the, the terrible, terrible life destroying consequences it can be to have these conditions all put together. Um, you know, and I had a I had a pretty rough childhood. And some bad things happened to me, um, and that did not help either because I had unde undiagnosed ADHD, and since no one knew that I had this genetically based physical difference in my brain, they just thought I was a screw up, and uh, it just everybody just it was it was bad. Bad things happened to me in my childhood. And my teen years were bad. Some very, very bad things happened to me as a result of this stuff. So I certainly wish I had known before. And I, I often wonder, I try not to, but I do wonder, I'm like, if I had been diagnosed early enough, back then they didn't know what it was. They didn't even think about it. But if I'd been diagnosed early enough and been treated early enough, what could I have been? And that's, that's a natural question to ask, to mourn the person you might have been mourn for the the kid you were having these problems 
And, you know, I'm just so extremely grateful and fortunate that I have managed to fall into a career that I can work with with my brain. It's, I spent decades working in corporate, hating every, every minute of it. I, it couldn't have been a worse fit for me, but I didn't think that I could do anything else. And so I just kept struggling along. Um, and so, you know, instead of thinking, you know, seeing yourself at your best, you're always seeing yourself kind of at your worst, which sucks. So yes, we need to talk about it more and there needs to be more understanding of what it is and what it can do and what it can become morbid with. Uh, one of the number one creations of ADHD is depression. Um, and that gets into these feedback loops and it just can become this problem. So uh, I hope you're doing well. Get diagnosed. Get medicated. Um, they're going to try you on different medications, different things, because uh, they're not going to know. They're not going to know what works or what doesn't work. And so you need to talk with you know, medical people that you're working with, people prescribers, um, and honestly therapy. You need to get a therapist because there's a whole bunch of stuff in your life, if this turns out to be true for you, that as you said, you look back and you're like, oh, oh, and things make sense. Which is good, because now there's no mystery. Now you know what happened. Uh, and that's that's actually quite freeing. You get medicated, though. And you, you talk to therapists, and, you, and you, know, you, you try to work on it, and try to move forward and figure out what's important. And what's important is today and tomorrow, and the people that are around you now. Those are the things and people who are important. I can't do anything about the past. Nothing. So... I simply do my absolute best to not think about it. I can't do anything about it. I can mourn for that poor kid, that that little boy, and the life he was about to start going through. I can mourn for that young man and the things that went wrong for him, but I can't dwell on it. It'll poison everything. Things are okay right now. Like, I'm moving forward. But we need to stand up and not let the world tell us that we're wrong and bad and lazy and stupid, and I, we just need to buckle down and work harder and you have to stand up and say you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And what you're saying is not only cruel and ignorant, it is entirely counterproductive and in fact harmful. Um, I found a, I was cleaning all the stuff out of the garage, uh, you know, moving stuff, because I, I opened up the attic and I kind of finished part of the attic so we could use it for storage and finish the garage. Looking through all this paperwork, all this stuff, found a letter from my dad when I was having all kinds of troubles in the early 90s, things were bad. It was a bad time. Um, and he wrote me a very kind and well-meaning letter detailing life lessons he learned being a golf caddy in the 1950s. All of the advice was well-meaning. None of it would work for me. None of it. Everything he was talking about was basically buckle down, keep your eye on the ball, blah, 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 do all this other kind of stuff. It would have, if he had tried to put me through that, I would have failed. Badly. And he would have said, what the hell? It would, no, he wouldn't have said that. But, you know, that's the thing, is other people's standards and criteria are based on their neurotypical brains. I'm neuroatypical. Their standards are unapplicable to me. My brain does not work like their brain. My world is not their world, and their world is not my world. And their rules do not apply here. And the only person who's going to really take care of you are the people who love you, that you can treat well now, and the, and th th that's it, pretty much. All you can do is care about yourself, work on yourself, change your environment, change the people if they're toxic, and build a world for yourself that you fit into. That's all I can say about that. I have no business giving anyone advice, so I apologize about that, but I, I wish you luck on your journey. Uh, and with that, folks...